we need to we need to do one thing different this time, which was that we didn't do any introductions. Oh, last time. And everyone's like, who are you? Who are you talking to? Yeah. Okay, so I'm Charlie Harrington. I'm Oz. I'm Rue. This is the what is the name of this podcast, Rue? Do you even know? <laughs> she, she just got off a plane. Yeah. Okay. It's this is the Escaping Web podcast. Okay, that's my introduction. Our guest this week, I'm really saying that, is <laughs> Rue Harrigan. Rue is the strategic engineering projects lead at Slack. I am. Yes, you are. <laughs> We're gonna talk about that. Uh I wanted to start with a quote that I found from Rue's blog from twenty fifteen. Are you happy? Let's call it like it's barely a blog. Yeah, it, I, it, there was a lot of interesting stuff on there. This was one I felt like could frame the discussion. So this was the end of one of your blog posts. This is not academia. You let yourself in. You have to build your own door or more likely steal someone else's door and modify it to your specs. Then you build a thousand more doors and prepare for a maze. Okay, so that's been that was a couple years ago. How's the, how's the maze? Um, well, first let me say the suck is real and I'm definitely coming to you from a full day of like brain oozing, Mm. uh, attempting to write like the same 20 lines of code, uh, over and over. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm learning a new language right now. And also I was on vacation a couple days ago, so I feel the maze is real. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm feeling it, but I think I wrote that about like uh, actually accessing um, career options and uh, meaningful opportunities within the industry at large. But I think it is sort of interesting that there's a strong parallel between like the existence of being an engineer, like how do you navigate what choices you want to make or what what team what a team you want to be want, be on or like types of things you want to focus on, and also like the minutia of like how do you write a function without getting trapped into callback hell. Um, it's really, it's a really similar feeling. So, um, where should I start? Well, what, uh, what were you doing before you became an engineer? So I was pre-med in college and after that I went to go work for a healthcare technology company called Epic. It's based out of Mm -hmm. Madison, Wisconsin. And, uh, at Epic I started as a project manager helping clinical users. So mostly nurses and doctors Um, understand, set up, test, train, and go live with clinical software. Um, And while I was there, I... Did you want to be a doctor? Yes. Did you still want to be a doctor after you started working in the medical field? No. (laughs) (laughs) Was this this like, oh, I'm going to take this job and I'm going to study for the MCAT? Yeah. So I was studying for the MCAT for like the first year and a half I was in the job. And then I was just working way too many hours. And also the MCAT is hard. Did you take it? Uh, I took a practice. Okay. I'm not going to tell you my score. I'm not embarrassed <laughs> of it, but I just, there's going to be judgment around it. You're not a current doctor. Not a current doctor. Um, but I think what I realized is that I really liked, I felt a kinship with people in the medical field. My mom's a nurse, but um, I really didn't like the lifestyle and uh, working in software or like kind of being adjacent to software engineers at Epic gave me this exposure to like what it means lifestyle wise to work as an engineer. Um, Mm -hmm. Engineers had it pretty great at Epic. I mean, not that I'm, they worked hard, but um, the number one thing that they had that I did not have was they had blocks of time to work like in a focused way. I was in a very customer facing role starting out at Epic and I was like constantly on the phone and constantly traveling and always frequently on site. And I always had my waitress face on. What does that, what does that mean? Uh, what's the waitress? If you don't know, no, I mean, I do. I just want, (laughs) I'm looking at the waitress face right now, but what what does it mean? The waitress face is like, uh, the, the version of yourself that you present to a customer to kind of like ensure that, um, you you're managing emotions Mm -hmm. as effectively as possible to get to a positive outcome. So you're doing a lot of like absorbing and deflecting of what other people are feeling in order to like get them from A to B. And then as soon as you get back to the kitchen, 
<laughs> you're like <laughs> spit in their food. Yeah, yeah no, yeah. you don't spit in their food, but you do build com- camaraderie with the people on the other side of the bar. Yeah. Um. So for the kids at home, most important job you can ever have is being a server. Do that first. Like, Rue was a server. Rue and I are from basically the same hometown. Okay. And she was a server at Front Street Trotteria. Heck shout yeah. out. And <laughs> that's the place where I used to go. We were only allowed to go if we got a good report card. Okay. Well, I got a lot of good report cards, so we went there a lot. I don't remember Rue. But Drop. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. But they're known. At least I. we always got the deep dish pizza. They have this like insane deep dish. No, che- no sauce. You have a separate sauce on the side to dip into. And I've never seen it before since. It's basically a casserole, and it's yeah. kind of sacrilegious when you think about pizza in New Jersey, but yeah. it's delicious. Yeah. Oz, have I'm you ever... Check it out. <laughs> Next time you're in Red Bank. <laughs> have, you, have you ever been in the food service industry, Oz? I have not. Okay. No. Probably everyone who would have been served by me is grateful <laughs> and, then, and do not have a good waitress face. Yeah. Yeah, I have. I, I worked at McLoon's Riverside Dining. You've been to McLoon's, right? No way. Yeah, four summers. I did bus, run, kitchen expo server and it was just it was like pandemonium it was great because it was like half inside half outside rain would come down and then everyone outside would rush in and we'd be like battening down the hatches i'm like my busboy buddies and i are catching crabs off the side i still think it's like one of the best jobs i've ever had so Rue, <laughs> to connect this back to Rue, uh, i also think it's like really important to be able to have this like customer facing face and customer facing experience um you, like just to understand like the the end point of whatever company you're at is that customer and there's a link there and like ha- like understanding their needs and wants i'm sure not putting words in your mouth but like i'm sure that's been valuable over time for you definitely so the way i describe it usually is like i had this like deeply customer facing experience and then what i realized i realized there's a lot of pros to that i gained a lot of valuable experience and epic you can kind of think of as like a in this role, kind of like a consulting style experience, like a McKinsey or a Bain, you're working a ton, you're traveling, you're like deeply embedded in projects. Um, And I got a ton of skills that in San Francisco tech would be considered different jobs. Like I ran user research studies. I did at the elbow implementation support. I ran like testing efforts. I did a ton of manual testing. I did content creation. I did whatever writing I did. Um, what essentially pivoted into a product management role. And this is how I would explain it. So I'm like in this customer facing arena, I happen to have a bunch of customers who were leaders in the behavioral health field. Um, and they had a ton of complaints at the time. So I aggregated those complaints and I led focus groups and I basically just hung out with a lot of psychiatrists who were like, this is how the product could work better for me. Mm -hmm. And I made a list of those requirements and then I went on tour with them at Epic and I like showed up at meetings I wasn't invited to. And I like taped the list of people's doors. And I was like, we got to make this one thing for psychiatrists. They need it. That's actually interesting what they need. In healthcare, everything about your chart is private and individual, right? So you can imagine like, I don't want anything about my chart to be related to anything on Charlie's chart. But psychiatrists and anybody in behavioral health kind of deals in this funky arena where they see patients in groups. And so after you see patients, you need to write notes about them. And if you see 10 patients in a group, you probably want to be able to write one note and send it out 10 ways. Mm -hmm. But Epic just wasn't designed for that at the time. So after 18 months of pushing for group notes, like we got a team together. I started to work with software engineers directly and I acted as kind of like the PM would act for that product. And we got it to a place, Epic's waterfall style development. So we got it to a place where they were ready to include it in the next release. That's sweet. I, I, to me, that's like, was that something that wasn't your job and you just kind of made it a personal mission to do? Like, how did that sort of like... Sort of started out as a mission, yeah. but then um, as you like progress through the ranks there, like, it's, it's funny. It's like there's developers and then there's imp- everyone else. And so I was in the implementation category. So people who support software installs. And um, as you progress through the ranks in implementation, you get a little bit further from the customer and closer to the product. So I like started to crawl my way towards obviously you get to know the product better and you have more opinions. Um, so I started to crawl my way towards working on building the product. We had this great success with group notes where I was like, oh my God, this is what software engineers do. 
And then we got to this point where they were actually building and prototyping. And I remember making like a mock-up in balsamic or something nice. and also drawing a lot by hand. I didn't know what wireframing was at the time, but drawing a lot by hand. And then we got to the point where they were prototyping and I couldn't do shit. I couldn't do anything. And I was like, I just spent so much of my life, whatever, a year and a half of my life thinking about this problem set. And I don't have any tools like in my tool belt to address it. Um, so that really kind of sparked in me, uh, this realization that there was a whole set of skills that I hadn't really understood that I wanted to learn about. Mm -hmm. So shout out to my friend, Matt at Epic, who was like, yeah, my degree's in math. Like I taught myself how to code. You could definitely learn Java. Like, you know, try this website, get this book, start. So started trying to teach myself Java at night, got into it. Why why was it? We're using Java at work. That's just what, yeah, the team yeah. was using. So I had people to ask about And what it. was your hope that like, I really want to see this thing shipped. Like maybe I can help. Or were you already starting to see like inklings of escape? Well, first it was that, but yeah. then I was, then, I mean, I was able to get access to some of the code base and realize pretty quickly that like, you don't go from knowing no code whatsoever to like participating in a mature code base. Mm. Epic was founded in 1979. Oh my God. The database is in, uh, Cache, which is like some version of Mumps. It's pre SQL, I think. Have they changed their name? Because like Epic doesn't feel like a 1970s company name. No, I don't think so. Yeah. It's a noun. It's a noun. Yeah. An Epic is the grand retelling of a nation's history, oh, and okay. Epic Software is the grand retelling of a patient's history. Okay. I don't work there anymore, but it sounds <laughs> like I do. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, this whole, this four year period leads me up to this point where I'm like, whoa. This tool set, I see this generalized tool set and how we're applying it to the specific problem. But I think like the key to the the question you asked me like at the beginning is like, um, I care deeply about the problem, and software engineering is just a path to solving it. I I see a lot of things on Twitter, and when I was going through this, I experienced it too. When someone wants to learn coding, a lot of people who are already coders are like you. Just pick a project and you'll figure it out. And there, that's often not enough of kind of like a roadmap, I think. In some cases, maybe you do have something, but sometimes it's not. And uh, I think it's just hard to kind of give advice. And it's cool. In your case, you had this thing at work, which was like the impetus to like actually get out there and try and like tangibly do it. I don't know. And then what I ended up doing was like building a calculator or whatever, you know, something that did math. Yeah. Um, at first, but it was like, it was a moment of realization. And then... What I discovered there is that there's kind of a strict policy around having a degree related to the field if you want to become an engineer. So my degree is in biological anthropology. I was not going to go back and get a four-year undergrad computer science or applied math degree, just cost-benefit analysis. That just not going to work out for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I applied to coding boot camp, moved to California where people don't care as much about credentials, got into Hackbrite, did that for three months, and then got a job at Slack. Nice. I can't remember what the question was, but that was I would just ask for, I asked for your name. <laughs> <laughs> so if I heard you correctly, your, your primary motivation for um, becoming an engineer was just unlocking that additional skill. What elevated that skill? You, you listed like 10, 10 other skills mm. that you uh, brought together for your group notes project. What elevated software engineering to the point where you're like, I'm going to move. I'm going to quit. You know, I've done four years here, but that's enough. Uh, I'm going to totally make this change, multiple changes to switch into this field. So I think the number one thing for me at the time was that the, well, one, the feeling of focus, having focused time. And I had no idea whether or not that was like a trend in software engineering. Mm. If, but I, I just could see it at the one company I'd worked at and, you know, had been my only corporate job um, where I was like, I was just craving that. Um, the first skill I ever developed as a human, other than like walking and talking was playing piano. I started playing piano when I was four and there's this very like soothing element to sitting down for me, sitting down and being generative and music is ephemeral, right? Like it goes away kind of like all your code eventually, but the act of sitting down and producing something um 
I feel like has been like really critical to a healthy mental state for me throughout my life. And I don't have a piano, uh, right now and I haven't been able to play like regularly. So when I learned, when I sat down and started teaching myself to code, it kind of filled that neurological craving, um, that I come to know as a habit. Do you think that's a personal thing? Do you think it's a subset of people who crave that kind of experience? Or do you think it's a like an aspect of human nature that we want to be in this flow state? We want to we want to work on something for a long time and then just a bunch of people end up being salespeople instead and hating themselves. Well, so like I said, my degree is in biological anthropology. So asking me a nature versus nurture question oh. is like a little twisty. I, I definitely sit on the side of um, the human brain is incredibly plastic and flexible. And if nobody around you knew what flow state was, it might be a lot more challenging for mm-hmm. you to, cre- to crave it. But in the environment in which we currently exist, mm-hmm. I would say whether or not it's like part of your genetic makeup or something you learned by the time you were five, like most people would enjoy that experience. Mm-hmm. Does that answer your yeah, question? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I feel like we're kind of all worker bees and we're sort of built to be worker bees. And then, uh, like, you know, when I'm doing, if I'm caught in the flow of something, like whether it's like riding a bike or like playing guitar very poorly or coding, whatever it is, like, it feels good to do that. Like I made a little very crappy, uh, like kind of like TV stand thing out of wood last week. And it just felt so good to like be working with my hands and producing something. So, uh, I had a very similar experience to you, Rue, where my previous jobs were, my calendar was like skittles of meetings and it was horrible. And then in my first roles, like I'd have one meeting for five minutes a day that everyone said was useless. It was like, I have one meeting and everyone's like, we should really cancel this one meeting. We have two more meetings. You're like, are you kidding? Yeah. It's, it's absurd. Um, and I appreciate it so much. I've been like, uh, then the weird thing that you brought up piano, like I just putting on headphones and like listening to piano music and just like, I'd love to talk about that. Like, do you listen to music while you're coding or does that interrupt the flow state? Can you like be flowing on two things? I, for me personally, I totally can. Um, but yeah, what's your habit? Oh, yeah. There? yeah. It sort of depends. So like today I'm trying to write an app in TypeScript right now. It's kind of like my first foray into using TypeScript on my own. And I have to read a bunch of materials, right? Like I've, just ever along the way, I've just got all these freaking Google searches happening. Right. Mm-hmm. And so listening to music while I'm doing that type of like learning and trying things out is hard for me because I have to read English and code. But if I have done my healthy preparatory thinking about whatever task is at hand and I'm just writing code, then I usually listen to the same song over and over, (laughs) like for the week. And there are some songs that I come back to like all the time, like broken early classical, like the music that I learn to play piano too yeah. and then there are some things that are more like cyclical nice yeah. mine is the the soundtrack to Amelie <laughs> that <laughs> and is. it like opens with like uh, accordion and stuff and I totally had my headphones unplugged yesterday and then the guy next to me was like <laughs> it's like there's music there's music I was like oh shit uh, I was stuck on um, this song, The Wicker Man by Iron Maiden for like weeks, nice. which the hook is your time will come. And I think probably once a week, the person sitting next to me was like, again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, you brought up something about like the difference between when you've already learned it versus learning. Like what I think going to Hackbright, going to a coding boot camp like that, probably uh, you had to relearn or learn how you're going to pick up this new skill. You want to talk about like how, uh, what your habits were like and how those evolved as you like first dove into engineering? Yeah. So the reason I wanted to do a coding boot camp after kind of this couple months of self-study was um, foremost for the community. I'm definitely a big imitative learner. I mean, uh, statistically we all learn best through imitation and so I just wanted to be in a group of people who are doing the same thing as opposed to like taking online classes or Mm -hmm. even attending classes where um, like the expectation for socialization wasn't so high so 
while I was at Hackbright, which is, it's crazy that it's four years ago now, but while I was at Hackbright, I mean, my schedule was basically like get up, do some sort of physical activity, get to the boot camp, like study or do practice problems. Then you're in class like 10 to seven, and then you just kind of stay until you're ready to sleep. And I did not like make new friends. I did not like pick up any new hobbies. The only thing I did was start volunteering at a yoga studio in exchange for free classes. Um, I opened the studio on Saturdays and then I, I went to classes there and, you know, like w- I had one friend in San Francisco who I grew up was like a childhood friend and I met him one time in the three months that I was, uh, at Hackbright, like for tea. Mm-hmm. And he was like, how are you? And I remember at the time I was like, I am, I probably look wretched. <laughs> I, I'm a wraith, but, um, giving myself the three months to like be immersed in a topic and really not worry about anything else is a great reminder that like doing one thing at a time is so powerful. It's the most important, um, like mechanism for success that I've in my life. Mm -hmm. Every time I'm like, crap, I'm not succeeding. I'm not making progress on something. It's because I'm trying to do too many things at once. So let's see after that, but then after that there was like interview season and during interview season, you have to come back and put your waitress face on and say like, I'm worthwhile. Here are all my skills. Here's what I've learned. And Mm -hmm. here's what I brought from my previous career. Um, financially I was in a situation where like I had to get a job. I could not wait. And so I just did, you know, sent out a million applications, did a bunch of first round interviews and, um, you know, was working at Slack soon after. So when you got to Hackbright, so Going back to your previous role, I want to do this thing. I'm going to make the jump. But uh, did you feel like you were getting closer to self-actualization in some way that you're like, oh, man, I'm actually learning this stuff and I'm coding and I'm eating it up and absolutely loving it? Like, what were your feelings like now that you were, you basically have become a software engineer? Yeah. So. Even before you got a job, you are, you're doing this. Your whole life or my whole life was about like staying on a specific path that's like laid out for you in school. Like get these grades, be the captain of this team, whatever, do mock trial because you're a big loser. <laughs> I loved mock trial. Shout out to mock trial. Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, and, and then when you go to college, you kind of come off that path. Like I think a, a lot of people have experienced that where you're like, I, there's just less direction, less support, but there's still like a very clear ladder. And then for me, I had a lot of friends who went on to careers with very clear strict ladders to law to finance where you're like you know you're working for a big company you could stay there 25 years and working for epic was definitely a little bit left field and moving to wisconsin was very confusing to people from the east coast although wisconsin is delightful um but when i made the choice to start learning to code and then Um, made the choice to leave Epic, which is an amazing job with great benefits. And like, definitely I could have stayed there the rest of my life and been happy and successful. Almost everyone I talked to about it was like, don't do it. What are you talking about? I don't know if you experienced this with people at Bradfield or like. Yeah, I I think we're in a different world here where uh, everyone is encouraged to learn to code and people are encouraged to take risks and uh, at least on our end. Uh, so for context for people listening, Bradfield teaches a lot of boot camp grads, self-taught engineers who've started to make it in the industry a few years in and then come in to level up and kind of reach reach a new um, point in their careers. So we at least see all the success stories. We see the really motivated students who have enjoyed their careers and just want to invest more in themselves. Um, so we probably exacerbate the... Uh, kind of trend of uh, everyone being encouraged to to do this. I think you probably know more students from boot camps than any person on planet Earth. I'm guessing, like, yeah, we've had we've had a good few hundred. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, when I when I hear about people being discouraged from pursuing something like this, where it's like, okay, if you had decided to go to LA and try and be an actor and like make it there. You can understand your parents being a little cautious, but uh, the like 
the upside of being a software engineer of discovering that that's what you want to do is so high and the 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 odds are pretty good even now with a lot of people going into the industry uh i think the boot camps are still doing a pretty good job overall placement rates are still pretty high so it's disappointing to hear people discourage you but i guess they're they're in their own stories they're their own tracks yeah and i think in a way because i'm slightly contrarian it was helpful for me where i was like i like felt a spark when i started Mm -hmm. thinking about um applying this tool set to problems that interest me and i'm very curious and also like the lifestyle and kind of like day-to-day experience really appeals to me which those were three things that i wasn't getting from my current situation and I just kind of like went with my intuition and said like, no, I'm going to do this and just try. And luckily, so um, Epic has a pretty, I mean, whatever, 60% of the patients cared for in the United States are cared for using Epic software or something like that. And there are tons and tons of IT departments all over the country who would gladly, I think, have employed me once my non-compete was up. So I basically had this year where I was like, all right, if it doesn't work and I don't get a job and I have to like be a waitress and live in somebody's basement and like scrape around for a year. That's okay. Because I know I can go back to something, um, which is obviously an incredible, um, privilege to be like pretty confident that you're going to, you could go back and get a job. And you just miss Wisconsin probably. Well, in the summer. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But, um, I don't miss like snapping the handle of my car door off. (laughs) in the winter oh my gosh (laughs) but um but the feeling of like then actually i guess so this this all this build-ups to say i had my whole life been on these tracks that had sort of been laid out for me this is the first time that i feel like i found something that was interesting to me not only had no one suggested it but most people had discouraged it i went for it I, through a combination of hard work and a ton of luck and also just privilege in general, I was was able to land a job at a great company. And the feeling was, is the best feeling. (laughs) I got to Slack the first day so early and I talked to the doorman for like 45 minutes before he was like, Brew, you can go up. You know, you're okay. You're allowed to be here. You have a badge. Um, That's amazing. And I was so... So, so, so happy. A different type of happy than, um, than I'd been before. Yeah. The, I wanted to talk about this because something else I had read that you had written where at least in Silicon Valley, people have these 12 month, 18 month stints at various companies Yeah, and you've been at Slack for four years now, three Three and a half, three and a half. Tell us about that. Like what's, What's like, what has your experience been start to finish? I know you've done so much, so many different things at Slack right now. So look, can you just walk us through this kind of timeline that led to the role you're in now? Well, so Slack is a, almost a completely different company in some ways now than it was when I started. When I started, there were maybe 300 people there, something like that. Mm-hmm. We've been in a couple different, couple different offices. We just went public. It's, it's a crazy time. Um, let's see. I started out as an entry-level software engineer on the platform team, um, which is the team that manages the APIs and developer tooling um, at Slack. It was an amazing place to start, first off, because I think it's a team full of incredible people. We had an incredible leader. Um, And second, because being in a feedback loop where your customers are developers is the freaking cream of the crop, in my opinion. You're building tools. You're also building test apps that consume those tools, those APIs. And then you're putting them out into the world and the people who are consuming them, they're not like, hey, I can't get this to turn on. They're like, hey, here are the error codes. Here are the timestamps. Here are the cases that I tested where it works and doesn't work. It's like the best. And we have an incredible developer community too. So we're really lucky um, with that. But it was a great place to practice being both uh, an engineer at like a pretty large company, like a, you know, with defined processes and building these like little one-off scrappy nothings, Mm -hmm. um, which 
was very, very hard. It's still hard for me, um, but very rewarding. So what's hard specifically? Uh, kind of like splitting your brain in two and, and like our code bases and PHP. So I learned PHP and kind of learned the ins and outs of our code base. And then also would be working like in another language, mm-hmm. like Python mostly at first. Um, and so like switching between those two was when I was at the beginning, I barely knew anything and I was trying to like advance in multiple technologies at once. So, um, but it was great. Did they get specifically, like, did you get staffed on a team that had like one specific project with like a long-term deadline or were you maintaining something like as an entry level person coming in? What were, what was the first thing that they gave you that you could cut your teeth with? Okay. If you're familiar with Slack, the first thing that I worked on was the reminders feature. Which is, can you remind us? Yeah. You Did can you like set reminders in Slack using a slash command, slash remind. You can also hover over a message, click on the three dot button and hit like, remind me about this message in 60 minutes, three days, whatever. Um, and it's just a classic example of, they're like, okay, add buttons to, it was when we we're just adding buttons to Slack messages. They're like, add buttons to reminders, responses. So like, you know, delete this reminder, edit this reminder whatever. And it turned out to be like an, just an incredibly complex section of the code base <laughs> with, uh, it was a terrible first project. Yeah. Um, and I shouldn't say it was, it was a really good learning experience. There you go. There's the spin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it was, it was great because it was, it was a great moment for me to understand how like leadership at the company worked where after a month of really struggling and have, I had a great mentor, but I was like too timid to ask for the amount of support that I needed. And then he kind of was like, Hey, I think this is way hairier than you think it is. And going to, he like advocated for me and went to our manager and was like, Hey, this is a weird place to start. Um, and watching how in the situation I'd been in before in my previous job, it would have been like, get it done right. In a customer situation where you can just throw time at a problem and pay down at least a percentage of the problem. I experienced for the first time, or not the first time, but for the first time in the corporate engineering world, how like throwing time and resources at a problem may not pay it down where you're like, we actually don't understand this problem. We've spent five days and we failed 150 new times and, you know, we don't know the next thing. Um, so it was a good first project, like for understanding the type of planning that's required for any mature code base. Um, Oz, in your experience, like, how do you, how would you think about onboarding new engineers? Like, is this something that you like, when you hire new people, do you want to just like throw them at, do you have like a, do you have a problem in mind? Like, I don't know, like I I was recently onboarded and I think my first project was uh, pretty hairy and I'm, you know, (laughs) I might have gone in a different direction uh, to get me up and running, but like, is there philosophy there? I don't know. So I've, I've always tried to understand the person and their background yeah. and uh, kind of calibrate based on that and just really um, aggressively, well, not a bad word, uh, frequently check in uh, <laughs> to not check in aggressively. Is yeah. that a bad uh, word? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, I don't, you know, I, I think it's a very, um, uh, you're in a very fragile state at the very beginning yeah. because you're, trying to assess whether you made a good decision. You have a lot of self doubt. You can't see that other people are also struggling or that struggled as much as you're about to struggle. Um, so you definitely want to help the person, uh, not, not experience Mm -hmm. the the worst sides of it, but some people want a media project immediately, just like a motivating, challenging thing. Um, so sometimes it may be saying, well, this is what we're working towards. Uh, why don't you and I pick the piece of this that's our first milestone? Uh, yeah, because it's, sometimes it's like, oh, you're going to ship code in your first day. Well, is that going to like, are you changing a comma or a uh, punctuation mark uh, for like versus like, it's going to take you two to three weeks to even understand what the heck's going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think for me, what I realized with this first project is that it was like a solo endeavor with like, a, we're here if you need us. And then very quickly, what I realized is that my, the second thing I worked on, which was um, interactive messages in general at Slack, so buttons and dropdowns, was that 
folding into a team and kind of understanding how other people were structuring their time, asking questions like what was appropriate, what was allowed helped me get up to speed so much faster. So I think it's different for everybody. But for me, like I wanted to Im- people to imitate. And as soon as I had exposure to that, mm-hmm. it was just so much easier to calibrate. And the number one most important thing I think for entry level engineers to calibrate is like when you're hitting your wall, when do you go, like who do you go to and when do you go to them for support? Mm-hmm. Because I would just wait until I was like hanging off the cliff and it was 10 p.m. and I was like, oh my God, I'm so stuck on this thing and breaks help, but also knowing that you can save yourself time. Well, I, let's go ahead. Oscar. That, that reminds me of a, um, a friend's onboarding experience, uh, actually at a nonprofit called GiveWell, where uh, a lot of us do daily check-ins. It's a good way to sync up on things, even if it's a waste of five minutes in some people's uh, experience. Um, at GiveWell, for new hires, they did hourly check-ins with the, with the guy who runs the organization via Slack. So every hour, he would check in and see how your project is going. That sounds uh, horrible. Yeah, it sounded yeah. horrible to me. Uh, but the the idea is that you're actually going to get stuck very frequently at the beginning. And yeah. at the beginning uh, that you know, at some at some point, it's going to seem like you're spamming one another, and so you just extend the period out. But there is so much institutional knowledge that you don't have. Uh, so many ways that you could avoid pain. That like that quick check in. Once an hour, I would be so mentally wrapped up in my own head on that. Like, I'd be like, <laughs> everything's fine. Everything's fine. It's, it's been an hour. I should have had more progress. And now I'm in this, like, I'm digging this hole of telling them I'm all right. Yeah. So maybe yeah. you're going to do it in a way where it's like, I'm not, uh, I'm not checking up on you. I'm not scoring our interactions and yeah. assessing whether. To merit. Yeah. Oh, yeah I, I don't, I don't think I have the, the mental day. capacity for that. I get what you're saying, though. I like that. Rue, this was the first project. And you, one of the things you said was that you were able to go to a mentor and uh, this is like, I've just, cur- like, how do you find mentor? Like so many people want to find mentors and how did you have a mentor that quickly at Slack? And then generally I understand like you've done a good job of like amassing mentors over time and even, you know, being a mentor to others. So I'm a mentor what? queen. Yeah. What? Mentors, but <laughs> tell us so, about that. So Keith who was my mentor, yeah. my first mentor at Slack. He was assigned to me. So let me just say that. Okay. I was luck, very lucky that they assigned us. Was this the first mentor together. you've ever had in your life? Or was it like um, on day one, you're like, where's my mentor? Like I, you expected it. I did not expect it. But then they, they made it very clear that everybody who's – everybody gets an onboarding buddy. But if you're like an entry-level engineer, you get – you clearly get a mentor assigned. Cool. Um, I wasn't too clear on how often I could talk to him or bother <laughs> him. It ended up being a lot. But – um the best the the way that it worked out ended up working out really well for us is that we got we were on the same project so it's not like he was wasting time on a project that he didn't have context on um yeah mentors oh my gosh okay well i just i gave a talk about this a couple months ago but i think there is a ton of really bad advice out there in software engineering i mean on the internet specifically but also i get and also probably give bad advice accidentally (laughs) pretty frequently. Um, So I'll be careful what I say about mentors here. But I think the best mentors, the ones that I've had the most um, like enriching experiences with, I not know that they're my mentor and we work in tandem on something. There are so many people, I mean, I work at Slack, it's a very friendly place. There are so many people who would be willing to get coffee for 20 minutes and talk about X, Y, and Z. And that just very quickly hits an expiration date for me personally. Like I just, unless there's something specific I want to get out of that interaction where I'm like, what did you say in this interview? Or like, how did you decide on this, this, you know, technical choice? Um, Just getting together and saying like, how are you thinking about your career? No. Yo, you I, like as soon as you have this nice relationship, and as soon as you say, "Can you be my mentor?" It just disappears. It's creepy. Yeah, you it's don't want to do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I think it depends. Yeah. Um, but usually, well, for me, the way that it's worked at Slack is 
I get to know as many people as I can because I'm an extrovert. I'm a weird extrovert in this arena. Um, and also Slack is a pretty interactive uh, working arena. People like to get to know their colleagues and spend time in groups. Um, and then if there's something I want to learn more about, so like right now I'm trying to learn more about Node and TypeScript, whatever, then I try and figure out who has that body of knowledge and if they have like a side project or something that's kind of sitting in that body of knowledge. And then I try to go to people about things very, very specifically where I can, I can say like, I'm working on learning about X. Can we talk about this question? And then if they're, if you're lucky or they're cool or it works out frequently, what they'll say is like, Oh, you're building this app. Like feel free to, you know, if you have any questions, like let me know how I can help. Yeah. And I'm like, I will let you know. <laughs> um, so that's one thing for like, for technical mentorship. Um, and then for general career type mentorship, I struggle with this, but, uh, getting to hear people's stories and this is not mean like it doesn't have to be a face-to-face interaction, but just like finding whether they've done a podcast or written a blog or whatever for kind of their career trajectory, I find very interesting, especially in an arena where so many people come from all different backgrounds, um, to start to understand like the mosaic of experience that is Silicon Valley. Um, sounds like a good premise for a podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you guys in advance. (laughs) Thank you. Um, and so that's something I've been thinking about more as I moved into this new role at Slack because I've been like, how did all these people get where they are? Um, yeah. Do you want to tell us about that now? Uh, like how did you go from, I think your first role was on the platforms team developer. I think you did another, another intermediary role before this next thing, if you want to touch on that, but I'm definitely curious now that you're a mid-level engineer, like what directions you were considering? Were you thinking like EM route? I see yeah. uh, something else entirely. Like how did you navigate Slack to get to the point where you are now? Totally. So I was on the platform team for three years. Um, I did a short stint on our the team formerly known as Growth at Slack, um, kind of like a loan. What is it currently known as? <laughs> Just uh, life cycle. That sounds nice of the growth. Yeah. Um, and which was great. Um, just to like experience working with a different group of people, have a different manager. But after three, and I'd worked on a huge variety of projects on the platform team. I did not feel pigeonholed. Um, but around the three year mark, our CTO posted a job and someone on his team was leaving and it's like, it was like an internal only post and the only requirement was that you've been an engineer at Slack for 18 months. And the person who had had the job, um, spoiler, I got the job, right? Everyone knows this, but the person who had had the job is like a senior, extremely experienced, like technical guy. And I spoke to him about it before he left and he really encouraged me. I was like, here's how I'm thinking about the role, but I know it's an insane long shot. Like you and I are not comparable skill wise at all. And he was like, you're doing that thing that women do where they just don't think they're qualified for something that they might be qualified for. Just apply. The worst thing that can happen is they say like, no, but thank you. Mm. And so, uh, the focus of the job is to think about strategic projects that can impact the engineering organization at Slack as a whole. And there's kind of an opportunity there to make that external facing for like the future or internal facing for the current situation. And I chose to um, focus my application and like the interview process on improving the way the engineering engineering organization is currently run. I made a giant list of things I thought could be improved in the different types of projects that um, I could imagine for working on them. And they span technical process and cultural arenas. So they're not all technical, but to bring it back to our earlier theme, they, uh, the point of the role is to, like put an engineer with a generalized tool set in a position to solve problems they care about. Um, and I was like, after being at Slack for three years, I felt a really deep sense of loyalty to the team that had given me a chance. 
they had said like, well, you don't have a degree and you've been in a boot camp for three months and like, we could definitely hire a college grad instead of you, but come on in. Like I get emotional just talking about it. So I, after three years, I was like, man, I really love this team. I want to work more internally on engineering, what it's like to be an engineer at Slack. So this role came up, I applied, I got it. It was crazy. Was it super easy to come up with this list of like internal things? Yes. Were they already it, like, building? It fell and- out of me. I was like, here's, I mean, engineering at Slack is great. It's not like it's riddled with problems, but just ideas about um, like, you know, being growth oriented. Yeah. Like, did you talk to other people? Because it almost reminds me of what someone might do if they're running for like eighth grade student council and they're like, what are the big problems? Someone's like, we need a water slide in the, in <laughs> the cafeteria. Like, the seven up has been out for months. Yeah, exactly. So did you talk to other people or was it kind of like, I'm just going to do this, go. I did talk to some other people. Um, mostly like my mentors who I knew weren't, um, well, I mean, whatever, mostly my mentors, but it, it quickly became, I mean, a lot of people applied for it internally. So it quickly became kind of like something you kept to yourself. Um, and it was easy for me to generate the list. And I think that the experience of like assessing something as if it were a series of projects is a skill that I learned at Epic. Mm. You're like, okay, think about this problem, write the problem statement, define the project and how you can measure the outcomes of the project. That was so easy for me. Um, and then, yeah. The person in the previous role, were you aware of her contributions like did you know what she had accomplished in that role and like like oh I need to do something of this caliber or could you take an entirely different direction you didn't think about that so I was able to talk to them and kind of understand like reflections on the role from the past year and I had some visibility because it had to do with like our blog and like uh you know different recruiting stuff we've been trying okay um so I had some visibility but I didn't really let that influence that didn't really influence the list I should say okay um, and then I, well, how, the interview I, itself, gee, you did I an application. Can't tell. No, was it like whiteboarding, uh, diagramming all this other crap? No, it was the first round was like writing a, an application. The second was a, a one-on-one interview with our CTO. I'm like, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I yeah. think it's okay. Yeah, I don't know. You can... uh, and then the third round was I had to give a presentation. They gave me a topic yeah. um, about improving engineering education at Slack. And they said, present for 20 minutes on the topic, and then we'll ask you questions for like 10 or 15 minutes. Cool. And in my role at Epic, I had done hundreds of hours of public speaking and technical presentations. And I was like, yes, I'm excited to do this part. Um, and I don't know if I like confess this to anyone, but I, uh, in the week leading up to, I had a week to prepare from when I found out that I had the inter- you know, had the final interview until I was going to have it. Um, and I just started filtering everything through this lens of like, of the topic. And then that weekend I went into the office and I went into the room that I knew I was going to get interviewed in. And I like practiced my spiel in the oh room, like total eighth grade. <laughs> president yeah. style um for hours and that's genius i don't I, I feel like people don't practice enough when they're public speaking you literally should be in my opinion speaking it out loud you can't just read it you can't just write it so many people just rely on stuff but to be physically especially to know the room too is like yeah damn, i even wore damn. the same clothes <laughs> now you know now we know <laughs> um and So even though, so I went in and I was like, I was definitely nervous because the panel was my team and my team is like just basically a pile of senior engineering leaders and executives. And so I was nervous, but, um, I was able to get into it and like, you know, kind of hold my head high at the end. Uh, and the questioning was kind of scary because everyone's very deadpan and I didn't, I have had you know, I, lot, I knew a lot of people within the org at Slack, but I didn't have relationships with almost anybody in the room. I was like, these are all my friends, bosses, bosses, boss. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but then at the end, they kind of like cracked, if that makes sense, mm-hmm. where it was like serious. And then at the end, people were cracking jokes for the last couple minutes. Yeah. So that felt good to know that there were 
humans in there. Did you attempt any humor and levity, like, or did you go straight serious? I I think I just went straight serious. Yeah. It's hard to remember. Right, right. Um. Yeah. It's it's definitely tough to be presenting to the like panel of elders without any sort of like personal relationship with folks. So I know that can be like definitely intimidating. Now, now that you're in the role, how similar is, are the things that you're working on to what you had initially conceived of? Um, so, I mean, my team has been really, really great. My boss has been great in saying like, work on what you want to work on. And, um, obviously like if there's things that I need from you, I'll, I'll give them to you. But, um, my first two initiatives, one of them was at the top of my list from what I prepared. So that's great. Like the thing that I'm dedicating a lot of time to right now. And the other one came out of, um, an engineering feedback survey as like something we need to work on. Mm. Um, they're not secret. I can tell you the first thing is like collecting information about our org chart that, so we can visualize it in different ways. Um, to just get a deeper understanding of our org. And the second is making meetings better. So there's like a, a technical and a... Nice. Policy. Yeah. So I think a lot of folks mid-level, as we were talking about, are like, oh, which route should I kind of go? There's like the IC route. There's the EM route. It almost feels like you kind of like jumped over the entire engineering <laughs> ladder and you're now... You're, you're with the executives kind of making strategic level things. That's awesome. Was that, uh, how do you feel, like, how did you feel about making this trade-off to kind of pull yourself out of the IC route, for example? I felt mixed because I'm definitely, it's definitely, let me get the bad stuff first. Mm -hmm. It's very isolating. Like, I was deeply embedded in a team full of people I, like, love and respect, and a lot of them I'd sat on hiring panels for and, like, just felt really close with. And so leaving that after three years was hard. Um, and then also a wall kind of goes up between people who are perceived as leaders. No, I don't manage a team. I'm not a people manager. Um, but I'm still like kind of lumped into this category and then I sees, and I knew that to be the case, but it was still kind of a, sh a shock hmm. or it was just, it's something like, frankly, I mourned it where, um, yeah, it's, it's isolating. So that's something I think that I've gotten and lots of leaders have reflected this back to me that that's a taste of the reality of senior leadership at many organizations. It doesn't really matter if you're an engineer or not. That's just like kind of true up the chain. Um, and it's not for everybody. So that's been great exposure to understand it. Uh, and also I knew I was going to get less time to progress technically. And I was going to sort of start to progress in this fan of skills and, I think, especially because I don't come from a credentialed background and people don't look at me and think like, man, she was probably like a science whiz, uh, as a kid. <laughs> um, I do. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I think I just had some insecurities around like losing that piece of the identity that I really fought hard to keep. Totally. But on the upside, uh, that all is like personal ego and like, kind of bullshit that I am able to manage and like learn from. And the reality of the opportunity of this role is that it's super high impact. Uh, or it has the potential to be super high impact. I've only been in it three months. I'm not like, I don't have a ton of measured successes yet, but, um, and that was, that is what makes it worth it. Um, especially because the focus of the role is very aligned with, something I care about, which is like supporting this engineering team so we can grow and prosper. Um, and I think the last thing I'll say is the fact that people can, you never really know what your job's going to be like until you get into it. And the description seemed very flexible mm -hmm. and I've been really happy to uncover that. Like, in fact, my team is really flexible and my boss was like, Hey, you can actually work on the thing that you think is important. Like that's part of the reason that we picked you. Yeah. Which I was like. <laughs> that was a brain explosion. For yeah. The, uh, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was an exploding brain gesture. Um, I'm curious. 
your early motiva- motivation for being a software engineer was focus time. I presume you got this in the first three years of Slack. Are you still are you still getting this? <laughs> are you putting out an inconsistency in Ruse? Uh, well, no, I'm okay. just curious. It is something, because it's a trade. Sorry, yeah. It is a trade off that a lot of people make: increase yeah. impact, decrease the kind of um, individual joy of working on something and building something. It's definitely, um, it's definitely been an adjustment, and I think what I've come to, the conclusion I've come to is that I can set it up so it's cyclical. So, like the first thing I did in the in the role was set up a ton of meetings and try and meet all the new people that I hadn't interacted with yet and do a lot of listening and interviewing, which was great and helped me generate a lot of ideas, but I was in a ton of meetings and I didn't do anything other than like listening, speaking, writing. And after six weeks of that, I was miserable. And that's when I sort of designed these two first projects and one of which has focus time built in. So it's been a trade-off. There's less, there's less of that juicy mind meld stuff. And I'm alone is the other big thing. I'm not embedded on a team. So anytime I get stuck or I need support, like I have to rely on the relationships that I made before, um, to like keep moving. So that's something that, uh, it's a big change. What do you think about the post this position type thing like um because this in some sense i could almost imagine this being sort of like a there's like a term like you're the mayor or you're in this role for some period of time like have you you're only three months in so you don't have to have thoughts on this but where do you see yourself taking your career after this i'm really hoping the role will help me understand that i mean the exposure is incredible i get to go to and mostly just listen (laughs) um in on a lot of kind of high level planning and strategic discussions, which lets me see not just like what people's titles are and who they manage, but like really they're more of their day to day to get an understanding of what it means. What do our VPs do? What does our SVP do? Like, what is the C level up to? I still don't have, you know, it's not like I'm tailing these people, but I get more time. Um, And that has kind of helped me understand some things I don't want one of the most attractive elements of engineering to me is that um, being a manager and being a technical leader or technical contributor kind of like climb up these two separate ladders. It's one of the only roles that I know of where management isn't like the default requirement for a progression. Um, and we even see kind of this like TLM path, a technical lead manager path that that goes up the middle um and you see this at small startups all the time where like the manager of the team is also you know contributing a ton of code um so being in this role i could just get to observe who are our lead ics what are they like who are our tlms what are they up to who are our engineering managers that i look up to what does their day-to-day look like i feel so annoyed i even asked that question like as, as it was coming out of my mouth it seems so inconsistent with feelings I've had and you expressed where my whole life I'm I'm on this train and I know where I'm going and I have these paths. And then as soon as you're in this cool thing, I'm like, Oh yeah, but what's next? (laughs) And we're just, I, you know, I know I am so focused on like, you know, the getting, getting to the next thing or whatever. And never like, you're now in this role. You're now a software engineer. You're now doing this thing. Like, why can't we, yeah, it rocks. Why can't we ever just relax? And like, Some of this, I think this, like the thematic stuff we've been exploring when you're like breaking out of the like mundane routine work, do you like, do you think there's a place where people are like, this is it. I've made it. I'm. Oh yeah, absolutely. I I mean. Really? Yeah. uh, Well, I don't know if people in fact uh, recognize the, the benefits of any software engineering job, but it is a tremendous job. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say it's necessarily fair for everybody, but if you feel inclined towards being a software engineer, uh, now as a software engineer, it's open to so many people. You get there, you're well remunerated, you have an impact, you have a skill that's hard to replicate without doing the kind of work that you did. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you get to you get to solve problems. Um, you can do this remotely a lot of the time. It's a, it's a good package. Yeah. Um, you know, if you, 
I think it's it's like uh, you all know Mihai Csikszent Mihai, the flow guy. No. Um, so researcher uh, really popularized the idea of flow states and flow. He has a book called Flow. Uh, <laughs> Sounds on brand. Yeah. Branding, yeah. <laughs> um, and the the way he tries to present this idea is that well we're all we're all seeking flow but flow is a kind of channel uh it's a kind of 2d um a space in a 2d uh plane where if your problem is sufficiently challenging and you have the sufficient skills you will be within that channel you will be in a flow state. Mm. But the moment that the problem is too challenging or not challenging enough, or your skills are uh, too high or too low, you slip out of it. And so this is an incredible tool because you can start to say, okay, I'm in this part of the plane. um, And so I'm not in a flow state or like for weeks I haven't been. So either I could increase my skills to reduce my stress or I can make the job easier. Like, well, I think what I was getting at was maybe I'm in a flow state towards like a waterfall or something. Like, okay. is there, is the point just being in the flow state that I can just be content here? I'm moving in some direction. If you can do that and pay your bills, I think it's pretty sweet. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, like, how do I feel about my life at this moment? Like I could go do something else. I could go do, I could go do many other things. And that was true like before, but, um, I feel happiest when I'm in connection with my community or when I'm harnessing my craft at work. It's so, like, if I get to practice my craft and I get to be in connection with people that I care about and the first one or the community one takes time, right? Like I did not show up at Slack and feel like deeply connected to my community because I didn't know them. Mm-hmm. I showed up at Slack to practice my craft. And then over time, I built my community. Those two things like really haven't changed. Um, and I really can't imagine at this juncture, like a place I'd rather be, which is very affirming in light of the fact that like, luckily as an engineer, like many, many opportunities are open to us. Um, so I think it helped me come back to this place of like, what do I need to chase in my day to day to make sure that like one, my work is aligned with the st- you know strategy of the company, and two, I'm getting those two things: connection with my community, practice of my craft out of every day, because those are the things that make me feel fulfilled. And when you feel feel fulfilled, you can do the best work of your life. Which was like one of the slack sayings that really got me. Come do, here, do the best work, do the best work work of your life. And then another thing we would say is work hard, go home. Like do the best work of your yeah. life, but then like go hang out with your family. <laughs> like we don't need you here late. Yeah, yeah. That would actually be a great point to end the podcast. Not to, you know, I mean, well, I'm enjoying the conversation, but it'd be cool to say we worked hard. Let's go home. <laughs>